Uh, my name is Josh Eppard. I, I play drums in, in Coheed and Cambria. Um, I was in Coheed from the start, uh, you know, 2000. And uh, I don't know if you guys are, or you guys out there are familiar with the history of Coheed, but I actually left the band uh, in 2007. Um, I was a, a horrible, I was a heroin addict for a long time. So uh, I cleaned up and I came back uh, about a year ago. And this is kind of the uh, first record with me back. I missed two records. Um, so, you know, this is really special for me. And, and uh, you know, it feels like uh, kind of like going home without sounding too corny. But that's a brief uh, history of my <laughs> existence in this band. This Well, I think, you know, I, I really missed Claudio and Travis. I mean, we, you know, there's not really a substitute for living in a van together. I mean, you see the best of someone and the worst and those guys. I miss those guys. I certainly, I certainly missed playing with them. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't leave Coheed and Cambria in sound mind. I, you know, I put those guys through the ringer and leave is kind of they would have probably fired me if I didn't I just stopped coming and you know I was a drug addict and I always harbored a lot of guilt about that and uh eventually after years of not talking I got the chance to you know say sorry to those guys and, and we began to put the friendship back together I never thought in a million years that I would get a call to play with them again you know the band had continued I was in another band called Terrible Things uh that was on Universal and we, we had a record out and we're doing that um but, you know, I just never could have imagined in a million years that they would have called. Because it's ultimately what I wanted. I missed playing with them. So it wasn't really a decision. There was never a decision. It was if they wanted to play with me, I would be there in a heartbeat. I would drop whatever I was doing. And uh, really, you know, it was like a total, you know, things come around full circle. And uh, But it was just about the wildest thing in the world. I never thought that I would get a call from those guys. So I guess I did make a decision to come back. But I, it's what I always wanted. So... Um, well, for me personally, and I could speak for the rest of the guys, uh, you know, a, a really wide eclectic mix of influences, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd, a lot of classic rock, you know, The Who. Uh, and then from there, you know, we all kind of branch off and have different things that we're into. You know, I listen to a lot of pop music. Um, I just really like Kelly Clarkson. You mentioned her before. I really like her. Uh... There's almost like a tongue-in-cheek. with That's kind of my thing, the super candy-coated pop stuff. Um, you know, Travis is a total rock and roll guy, and Claudio's into things that are creative, so we all kind of branch off. But the home base stuff is a lot of, you know, Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and a lot of the stuff that we weren't hearing, you know, when we first got together, we weren't hearing, we weren't listening to a lot of bands where that was an influence, and I think that was definitely a, a conscious thing to try to bring a more classic influence and you could really hear that kind of come to a head on our second record in keeping secrets and, and it's continued uh, through the rest of the, the records Uh, I think I started playing when I was 10 or 11. Actually, the opening band tonight, three, who we're out on tour with, is my brother, uh, my brother's band. And I basically wanted to hang out with him and his friends. I thought they were cool, you know? They could drive. I was like 12. I was like, wow, was, you know, I want to hang out with those guys. So we started a band. Before that, you know, 10, 11, we would mess around. My brother would take guitar lessons, and there were drums laying around. Um, so, as any kid would you start messing around with him but around 12 years old we started a band and then it became serious and I would practice and it was just something that I enjoyed and uh, if you'd asked me back then I, I, I wouldn't have thought that it would have turned into a career but 
uh, I guess I'm okay at it, so I stuck with it. I really wanted to be a baseball player. That's what I would have told you when I was 12, but, and I played, you know, obviously Little League, Babe Ruth, uh, high school, but once people started throwing 85, 90 miles an hour, I thought I better practice the drums because this is not going to happen. Um, my brother puts out solo records under his name, just Joey Eppard, and uh, yeah, my brother's been a lifelong influence, and uh, I think I think it goes both ways. I think, you know, Coheed and Three grew up before record deals, before all that stuff, when we were just bands, working day jobs and playing music because we loved it. We rehearsed in the same house. You know, we shared each other's gear, uh, played shows together. So there's been a long history and connection with these bands. And, uh, you know, Joey and Claudio have both been huge influences on me musically uh, and personally, you know, just in life. My brother's one of the most amazing, generous, kind-hearted people. And, um, you know, I got to say, I enjoy his solo stuff as much as the band stuff. And Three's probably one of my favorite bands, uh, Easy. But tonight you'll get to see the whole band and... It's definitely different, but uh, equally as awe-inspiring. It actually sucks going on after them, because they just slay it every night. Without a doubt, the best band I've ever seen. I almost wish Joe wasn't my brother, so I could say, because people always say, ah, it's your brother, that's the only reason you're saying that. But they're really, literally, the best band I've ever seen. I've never seen a band as good as them. Man, I'll tell you, uh, we we did a record. Um, Claudio is always creative. Anybody that knows Claudio, he, he never stops working. And maybe that's because it's it's not work to him. Or, but he, he just never stops. He's always creating. It's a real inspiration to me. Uh, so to hear such a kind of wild idea, I wasn't that surprised. But we had done this record, which we recorded in a couple days, just at a home studio, with no talk of the concept. Um, I'm sure it was kind of, you know, the wheels were turning, so to speak, in his mind about it. Um, and the first time I heard about it, he just kind of said it nonchalantly. I never had any idea it would turn into this thing. And, uh, I, I said, oh, that sounds cool, man. Uh, you know, like a lot of Claudio's ideas. Um, but it obviously, you know, really came to fruition and became such a big part of co and Cambria. But at the time I didn't, not that I didn't respect the weight of the idea. I didn't really, I said, oh man, that sounds awesome. Kind of thinking probably never happened actually, but, uh, you know, it's something that he felt inspired to do and, and I think he's done an incredible job with it you know I got to tell you when the first comics came out I was not impressed I thought that they were bad um I just and and I think maybe and I don't want to speak for Claudio or get him in trouble but I think he's done so much great work and really let this story evolve like the graphic novel with good Apollo one I thought was incredible and and it's just it's a real treat to be involved in the band and watch the story evolve I mean, he just signed a deal with Leverage, which is Mark Wahlberg's company. I mean, does it get any cooler than that, you know? I hope he makes the next Star Wars. I'm really seriously proud of him. Well, I think, you know, I can only really give you the broad strokes. I'm not really allowed to talk too much about it. But um, I think with just like music or anything, just like what you guys do over time, it, it evolves. Different ideas inspire you, uh, and I think Claudio wanted to meld the Bag Online Adventures kind of into the Emery Wars. He saw that inspired him more, and uh, you'll notice some of the same themes in those early comics pop their heads in, in the Emery Wars, and it's kind of not a redo, but uh, a bit more of an evolved uh, and a bit better, in my opinion. I thought it got a lot better. I thought there was a real leap in the writing, the artwork, the whole nine, and I think it continues to evolve, so I don't know if that answers the question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, Mike's a good dude. You know, he he robbed a pharmacy. I mean, that's why he's not in the band. Um, you know, after everything that happened with with me and Mike in uh, in 2006, with the you know everybody in this band had worked their asses off for years to achieve a goal. You know, I mean. It wasn't about record sales, but it was about reaching people. And we put that all in jeopardy. And you don't see that like this, you know? We, you're a drug addict, and Mike Mike cleaned up. I left the band, me and Mike were gonna, oh, we're gonna start our own band, blah, 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 just junkies. Um, and Mike went back to Coheed, and he cleaned up, and there, I was bitter about that for a, a few years, you know, really, it hurt me. Um, you know, I felt left by him, but I, once I cleaned up, I, I was really proud of him. But staying clean is hard, and I guess he didn't 
stay clean. I, I guess that's pretty obvious, right? And I don't mean any disrespect because I, I really think the world is, is a better place with Mike in it. And I, and I know Mike is a good guy. He just is sick and needs to spend some time on, you know, figure this thing out, you know. I don't think I know everything. In fact, I'm smart enough to know that I don't know anything. Um, but I know I won't. I'm done with drugs. I've seen it. You know, I've lost five friends uh, to OD, you know, that OD'd uh, countless friends in jail. And uh, I think Mike's got to figure this thing out, man. This thing ruins a lot of lives. And uh, everything that Coheed has already been through, they're not going to sign up and do it again. I mean, get it together. And not to mention, Mike can't leave, you know, uh, Massachusetts for, you know, a couple of years. And he's in a lot of trouble. So I think the decision was made to, to finally move on. And it wasn't one they made easy. I mean, I know that Claudio and Travis, they care about Mike a great deal, as do I. Uh but imagine that you were those guys. Wouldn't you just be a little pissed off? You're on tour with Soundgarden, and you go and rob a pharmacy. I mean, that is not the act of a sane man. And, uh, you know, I love Mike. I love Mike to death, and I really wish him the best. And if there's somebody out there that can beat it and come back from this thing, it's Mike. And I really hope that that's what happens. Well, there's challenges just being a musician. I, you know, the normal things that any touring musician could relate to, it, you know, uh, it's tough to be away from home all the time. Uh, well, you have to find a way to deal with it. That's actually not tough for me anymore, but it was for a long time until I learned that it's up to you whether it's going to be a total drag or whether it's going to suck. Like our sound guy, oh, this bus sucks. Guess what? Even if it does, it's up to you whether it's going to be a total drag, you're going to bitch and moan about it all day, or you're going to say, all right, I'm going to make the best of it. And that same thing applies to touring. Um, but that's one of the big challenges that musicians face. I mean... You grow up practicing in your garage, you want to be a musician, and then all of a sudden it becomes a reality and you realize, wait, girlfriends and things like that, forget about it, wives, you know, that you have to dedicate your life to this. So that's one of the big major things. Um, you know, always, I, I'm i 32 years old, uh, you know, I'm not a kid anymore and I, I try to learn every day and, and get better and, um, you know, that's always a challenge and I think as a band, we just, every time we get on stage, we want to be better than the night before and... Uh, you know, that's something new with Coheed. The last few years of Coheed, and I hate to say this, but, you know, me personally and probably Mike were phoning it in, you know, while Travis and Claudio were working hard at getting better every day. We were just bitter. I, I don't know what about anymore. I can't remember. Um, and angry. But uh, it feels really fresh and exciting and new to have kind of the same share the same energy and to try to that's i think the biggest challenge is to try to be better every night we get on stage and to keep progressing i mean we we all want to be great you know i love rap music you know i got a lot of friends that and I, you know i did warp tour in 2011 and it was a it was it was fun you know i love warp tour and stuff i opened up for ludicrous in china and you know i did some cool stuff but uh i'm just focused on coheed right now and Really, the ultimate goal with Weird Science was to be a producer, and um, there's some there's some things happening that I sure wish I could talk about, but uh, I guess I'll get in trouble if I do, and I had to sign things that say I can't. So, um, but I think that's the road that I'm headed down, and that was always kind of I knew all these rappers, but all they talked about was shooting people, and you know it was kind of lame. So I started writing rhymes for them, and then they couldn't really do them. So I was like, well, let me do it, and then you do it like I do it. And I kind of fell in love with doing it. I realize it's a little weird. People are like, oh, you're a rapper? <laughs> but yeah, you know, I grew up in New York and I love hip hop. Hip hop's probably my favorite kind of music. Um, and, uh, but I think, that, you know, when I think back to why I started, it was always that I really wanted to help craft these songs, maybe with other MCs and, and do things like that. So that's where that's headed. And there's some really interesting opportunities uh, ahead that I'm really excited about. So hopefully it, you know, comes to fruition or whatever. Oh, I mean, come on. I Obama. Um, not that I'm the end all. You know, I would say my knowledge is uh, either novice, uh, juvenile at best. But, you know, I think we should give the guy eight years. Uh, 
And Romney just kind of scares me. Uh, you know, we had a friend, we stayed at his house the other day in Virginia, and he had this story. That Romney, when he, he did a speech in town, like Fairfax or whatever. Now, where we are is like a gated community. Obviously, this guy is mega, mega successful. And he's telling us that Romney was going around this nice gated neighborhood knocking on doors. He has a Korean friend who's in his 20s, very successful, and he opens the door. It's Mitt Romney standing there with cameras, and Romney goes, do you speak English? And this kid was born and raised in America. And then he says, is the owner of the house home? And the guy just laughs. And that to me, is Romney like that out of touch? I mean, I think that he is. And I just thought it was really funny. Kind of Maybe that encompasses my uh, thoughts and feelings about Romney. And I don't pretend to know everything about politics. I do vote. I think it's important. You know, I was jaded just like everybody else after, you know, the Gore-Bush election. Um... But I think it's important to uh, to still vote, and I do, and you know the whole band does. We have our absentee ballots and stuff. But my vote goes to Obama. I might not agree with everything uh, that he says, but I think we should give him a full eight years, and and uh, you know I'd like to see some real progress, and and hopefully we you know take the country forward because there's some serious issues. Uh, yeah, not nothing like crazy or anything. Um, a lot of stretching, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure we all have our own things that we kind of do in our mind. I count down from 100. Uh, it's just something I've done since I was a kid. It, like, centers your whole being. Um, but that's about it. I think everybody in their own minds has their own little things they do. But we don't do, like, a chant or anything or a secret handshake. Maybe we should. We'll try it tonight. It'll be the start tonight of our back show, backstage ritual. We went back to... Uh, the first three Coheed records were recorded at this studio. Um, well, the first, first one was done at a house, but we mixed it at this studio. This studio is in our hometown. It's called Applehead. Uh, my father built it. A um, lot of history there. We've known the guys. There's two record. There's two songs on the first Coheed record that were done at this studio, you know, three years before the band was even called Coheed and Cambry. So a long history with these guys, Michael Birnbaum and Chris Bittner. Now, when I left Coheed, they went and did two records with other producers, but they, they came back to the studio, and um, and then obviously having me back, there was a lot of old relationships there, a lot of history, and uh, I think we were trying to capture some of that uh, magic on the first three records by going back to the same studio, So, and then obviously having me there. But it just felt, uh, I know it sounds just kind of cheesy, but it really felt like home, you know, and I just... I think it was definitely the most fun I've ever had making a record. It was a really, you know, you got to understand, by the third Coheed record, I'd come in, I'd knock out the drums in two weeks, and I'd take off. And there was a lot of resentment. I think we were all a little tired of each other. There's no, who knows how to deal with things like that? You know, we're playing to five to 10,000 people a night. Two of the guys, me and Mike, are, are shooting heroin all day. It's just, it was getting to a point where it was, really ugly so to come back to this place and have it not be ugly and to have you know you're a little bit older there's communication and it was just like a really free creative record the whole band was there the whole time sharing ideas and just having a good time and, and I think that those kind of things they go into the microphones and they get pressed on that record it's something that you can feel and hear on this record and I, and I, I think that we did a good job of a great job of capturing it I, I literally could not be more proud of, of the Afterman, both records. So, Well, with, with the Afterman, it's a double record. It's being released a couple months apart. Uh, the first part, Ascension, comes out October 9th, and the next part, Descension, comes out in February. Uh, and that, that came about, the reason it's a double record is because we had so much material that we just couldn't find a way to fit onto one record. And you know, if you're going to cut it down to one record, oh, we're doing away with this song. Man, this song is really weird. It, it just belongs, man. It's so out there. And then we started entertaining the idea of a double record. Uh, we didn't want it to be hokey or you know, gimmicky. Uh, it really just was born of too much material. And I think that speaks to, you know, how much fun we were having in the studio. And, you know, we made this record differently than any record I've ever been a part of. We didn't have a whole record come in knock out the drums knock out the bass then it's guitars and then it's Claudio singing for a month a lot piled up we did it let's get these two songs let's go to Claudio's house and jam in the basement on them and learn them 
and then let's get the drums for these two songs, and then the bass, and then the guitars. Claude, you want to sing a little bit? And I think what it did is it let each song kind of have its own character. It wasn't just a batch of songs that we recorded. Each song came from, you know, you feel different from Tuesday to Wednesday, but you feel really different from week to week or even month to month. So, you know, setting up the drums in different parts of the room and, uh, you know, different amps, different guitars, and just really gave each song its own, you know, we focused in and honed in on each song to give it its own kind of sound. And, and I think that lends to the uh, uniqueness of the record. And, uh, and again, we were just, we would come in ready to work on this song, but Travis has a guitar riff. It catches Claudio's ear. And we were free enough without any kind of boundaries that it could be like, set up the drums. We're recording this song right now. And that happened with a couple songs, just things that were written right there in the studio. And I mean, that's what it's all about is, you know, being creative and, uh, you know, it's fun to put together a song. I mean, ultimately, that's why we do this. Uh, whether we're good at it or not, only time will tell, but we sure have fun doing it. And, uh, you know, I think we think we're pretty good at it. And it's always interesting and fun to kind of push your own creative boundaries. And, you know, we did that on this record. There's some stuff that's really out there. And I remember thinking only a band, and this is the reason I really miss playing with Coheed, uh, only a band like Coheed could do, go so all over the map and have it not be weird. Uh, you know, I was in a band that was pretty much like a straight up rock band. And we were just bound by that, you know. Oh, that lyric's scary. Or I would say things like, man, we got to put an opera chorus in here. we got to have a choir going in here. They would look at me like I had two heads. We're in Coheed. That's what it's all about. Um, and, you know, I think me and Claudio specifically like to make, or at least pretend we're making mo a movie with the music. You know, it, we want it to be cinematic. And through that, you know, I think it creates, you know, a feeling you feel like you're at this place and that's always what uh, we've really you know uh, enjoyed about making music and I think that's really evident on this record on both both records Ascension and Descension and you know I'm just really excited for the Coheed fans to hear it I, I do feel I understand what the Coheed fans in general not that they don't like Black Rainbow but it was a bit of a departure I thought Black Rainbow was incredible Coheed's last record and No World for Tomorrow, the record before that, was probably my favorite Coheed record. Um, but I think this was definitely kind of a return to the more classic elements that maybe some of the Coheed fans were missing in those records. But just to be clear, that's not a diss to those records. I think those records were incredible. I heard a lot of growth, certainly with Claudio as a songwriter. And I think that all, to me, it felt like that all came to a head on this record. Uh, but we had a bit more of the experimentation and, you know, going back to that studio that we hadn't been at in years. We're back there together. I think we couldn't help it. Kind of some of those classic elements that were there on the previous records kind of rearing their heads. And I'm uh, just really excited for the fans to hear it and, and respond to it. I, I know they're going to love it. question i like that uh what do i think life is uh i'm gonna try to not go just off the top of the head here i mean i've thought about that um to me i think that life is 
I mean, it's a journey. Who, what, where, and why, I'm not really sure. I don't know. I've often laid in that bunk back there and thought a lot about it. But I don't, And I don't know if this is a solid answer, but for what my life is, I want the good to outweigh the bad. And uh, that doesn't really answer the question now, but I found a lot of solace in, in that, that I don't know about heaven or hell. I don't know. I just don't know. I think a lot about it. Um, but ultimately, the simple answer for me is I want the good to far outweigh the bad. And I want to create good in the world and not be part of the bad. And to me, that's what my life is. Uh, the overall life, I, I just don't know. I, and I, don't, I really don't know how to answer that. Oh, yeah.